there are soldiers in my family. I first joined the Legion to honor their service. Now I volunteer there to be of service myself. I know my membership helps Canadian veterans get the support they need. I've personally seen it help veterans get through some pretty dark times. Many have come out stronger than ever. For a lot of them, the Legion feels like home. It's nice to be part of that. Hey everyone, Matt Sanderson here joining you for another episode of Attack Wrap next week. Join us at Tuesday night, on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. where we'll have Caleb Pearson and Nolan C along with us here joining us via Skype. We'll catch up with them and see how things have been going in their lives right now on Attack on Rogers TV. Stay tuned. The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hi, and welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. Politically Speaking is a program that lets you hear directly from all the elected members in our community. And especially in this time when we're dealing with COVID, it's really important that we hear directly from those, those voices who are leading us in this challenging time. I want to assure you of a couple of, of one thing. First of all, uh, my guest today, the Honorable Bill Walker, MPP for Bruce Gray Owen Sound, and I are in very separate locations. Bill is in his office in Hepworth, and I am in the, my home studio here in Owen Sound, which is why we're not wearing masks. But thank goodness we can see each other and the technology is working. Bill, good to have you here. Thank you very much, David. You're looking well. <laughs> thank you, thank you, you too. Um, I, in my imagination, have you tidied up your bookshelf a little? I know I haven't touched it unless my unless my dear wife has. I certainly haven't done anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't rate your we won't rate your backdrop at all. But I, just before we we started our broadcast, you dropped a little a very interesting um, statistic uh, that uh, because you're a member of cabinet, you have got uh, your your work is uh, very very busy, and um, you uh, have had a lot of meetings. How many meetings have you had in the recent past? Well, what I was sharing, David, is, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not certainly tracking it, but someone on one of our recent cabinet calls made reference to it was in excess of 150 meetings just on COVID, just on cabinet. And then many of us, of course, have other committees. I'll suggest I'm not on it, but on Treasury Board, again, they probably have an equal number because everything that has to be be brought through from a financial perspective has to go through that committee and cabinet. So uh, to your point, certainly has been busy and, and lots of continuous moving parts. And I would think the, the Minister of Health as well has a lot of um, very busy and very involved uh, matters to deal with, as as well as a number of other of other um, uh, members of cabinet. So it's uh, there's a lot of work behind the scenes that perhaps we don't uh, we don't appreciate. And just so folks know, once uh, Bill leaves here, he has to move in shortly after into another Zoom meeting with uh with cabinet so the, obviously it's a it's an ongoing busy part of your day absolutely and, you know to your point david i can't say enough about minister elliott uh, you know she is at every single meeting of the command table there's, there's then the re the vaccine committee uh you know so she again is going around the clock as many people are but but especially obviously the health perspective and, and the leadership that she's providing I, I just can't imagine the schedule that she's keeping uh, yes, yes, she certainly is uh, uh, doing doing the kind of work that uh, is necessary in this particularly challenging time. Well, speaking of, of COVID, we might as well start there because that is the subject that dominates a lot of people's thinking. Uh, let's talk for a moment about vaccines and vaccine rollout. Um, Dr. Ara has been very complete 
in his explanation of, of what's here, what's come, what's here, what's being done. Um, and I noticed that uh, as of today, when we're, we're recording this, that uh, they've had another 600 doses of the Moderna vaccine, which will be administered quickly uh, to people in long-term care. But uh, he's also uh, laid out the, the, the preliminaries around uh, vaccine rollout for the public. That's, uh, that's, quite, that's good news. Yeah, again, can't say enough about the work that uh, Dr. Aaron and his team have done, David. You know, he, he has gone above and beyond in regard to putting even a more proactive schedule towards the vaccine task force. Uh, kudos, frankly, to Chapman's Ice Cream, Amber's Power, who both again stepped up and made freezers available so we could actually be one of the first. Dr. Ayer was very proactive saying, we will do one in, in an area like Bruce Gray Island Sound uh, and show you just how effective it can be and how well we can get it out. So, you know, the challenge is, I trust most people, but I'll share it here. You know, the challenge right now is physically accessing enough vaccines. Uh, there is a very sequence plan to be able to address those hot spots, particularly long-term care and the, the patients as well as the staff and the, the caregivers first and foremost, and then there's a very, very detailed uh, rollout following that. And in each area, for example, Bruce Gray on sound, uh, Dr. Era and his team will put that together. And I'm very confident that again, they're looking at all of the various criteria for people who are most at risk. So, you know, there are going to be people and they do call my office and his office saying, when can I, as a member of the general public, uh, obviously that will be done in a staged manner, but I have full confidence that he is looking at who is the most susceptible who needs it the most and who uh, you know, may not be always intuitive to some people saying, well, why wouldn't this occupation or this person get it? Uh, he's the expert. He has the training and the experience and the background in infectious disease and, and pandemic management. And I have full confidence in his plan. And uh, I think it's great how open and transparent he's being with the public to try to keep as much information. The challenge, of course, is something like last week when we found out we were going to get delayed shipments, that has to start changing and you have to be flexible and you have to adapt to what your current situation is. And again, General Hillier at the very highest level, very much doing the same. And I can't say enough of having some of his capability and, and, and aptitude at the helm uh, in this time. Yes, I think that uh, while there is anxiety among people for, uh, for that vaccination, it's, uh, you know, it, we are kind of, I won't say we use the word, well, I'll use the word hostage. We are captive to um, the, the supply chain and uh, everybody wants those vaccinations and everybody wants them now. But the reality is we have to wait. Yeah, and again, I mean, you know, everybody in the world is again, clamoring for the same capacity. They're, they're, I, I trust everybody is working their best to get as much physically out the door. Uh, all I can assure people here is as a province, we have a plan in place, a great task force being led by General Hillier and locally, Dr. Aaron and his team have it ready to roll. The plan is there, it's already identified. It's just physically a matter of getting the actual doses. And, and again, you know, we've extended out to people like pharmacists who again, very capable. We saw it through the flu season, how capable they are. And again, how efficient we can get it out as quickly to all the arms that want them as we possibly can. Well, let's hope, and, and uh, I'm sure that uh, people, many people are quite ready to, to step up whenever they're needed. I, uh, I have to say, I, in a conversation earlier in the, in the pandemic, uh, I asked Dr. Era, um, you know, uh, how is he doing? I mean, is, this is hard stuff. He said, no, this is what we train for. This is what we do. This is where we work, and we will do our best and i think that that says it all he's quite he is he has done very very well for for this uh, for this community for for gray and bruce he has david and, and again if i can just get a couple of seconds i, I want to share one piece that uh, you know my office and, and myself personally get a lot of calls a lot of emails a lot of texts a lot of any way people can get a hold of me throwing out their theories uh 99 of those i i push back to I'm putting full faith in someone like Dr. Era, who is the only person in my mind that has the, the background, the training, and the logistical abilities from a, a pandemic to truly be uh, at the helm in this. He has the legislative responsibility. He is the person most responsible in, in our area, in our catchment area. Um, you know, and there are theories of other people saying, I should have done this, you should have done this, you shouldn't be doing. Lots of people calling my office saying, well, why aren't you listening to other people? Uh, I fully put stock in 
his training, his background, his education, his experience, and his network of other like-minded people. Uh, I, I think one of the things that gets missed is managing a pandemic is much different than other forms of healthcare. And there may be specialists, there may be people in other walks of life in the medical background that say, I would do it this way, or they dispute. But are any of them truly trained and experienced in pandemic management and leadership? Uh, in my case, I believe in our backyard, Dr. Eric is the foremost person to lead that. I think he's doing a great job in concert with his team and, and the people that he has surrounding himself and the access he does. And at the highest level, we're following a very similar thing with Dr. Williams and a cadre of healthcare experts specifically focused on pandemic management as opposed to more generic healthcare uh, activities. And, and I get lots of, and I'll use the term armchair quarterbacks because we're in Super Bowl season, that think and suggest and, and do, uh, you know what, everybody's welcome to their opinion. But at the end of the day, I am fully versed and confident in Dr. Era and the other medical officers of health uh, who he's involved with. Yeah, that's good to hear, Bill, because th there is a lot of um, conversation out on social media about this, that, and the other thing, all kinds of theories. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have to agree with you that uh, the experts spend a lifetime training for this kind of stuff, and uh, this is what they do. And uh, just as, uh, you know, you've chosen a political life, uh, Dr. Era has chosen a medical life, and uh, he and his team have are, are incredibly dedicated. I've, I've worked with them over the years um, in my, my other work, and uh, I find them to be extremely professional and, and doing the very best. And, um, you know, you worry about them, but I guess, you know, in time this will end and, and they, will, they will get their due. But uh, we're very thankful to have them uh, on our side and doing the, the very best that they can do. I want to just shift things slightly because uh, I don't know whether you've seen today's case numbers. And we're on the we're, we're taping this on the 27th of January. And uh, our, the numbers of COVID have gone down again. And uh, is this a, is this something that uh, we can be hopeful about? Absolutely, David. I mean, I'm always hopeful. That's part of who Bill Walker is, is always trying to look for the op opportunity and the optimism. But it, it really is why we took the, the, the action we did in regard to the stay at home. Uh, what we saw in the modeling and the concerns that were shared with us as, as guidance were if you don't get those numbers down, you could overwhelm our healthcare system. And again, it's one of the pieces that I'm not certain the general public has as much knowledge of as obviously me, and I'm very fortunate to have the, access to that information. If the numbers kept skyrocketing, if they kept moving upwards, you would have situations where our healthcare system would be overwhelmed. And, and what I mean by that, David, to bring it home, is you only have so many, in my mind, um, those high-level acute care nurses and, and, and medical professionals. If they were to be infected, you start to lose. We don't have a backup cadre around the province that are just waiting to come in and replace people. So that becomes a challenge. You can always add physical beds, if you will, and people will say, well, there's lots of empty beds at Gray Bruce Health Services. Well, there may be, but you need the health resources to be able to staff that. You also want to keep the rest of your health care system moving forward, Reverend. People that are waiting on surgeries and those other types of acute care needs, if they overwhelm the acute care beds and the ventilators and those type of things, other people that would need those types of facilities and services for regular healthcare needs would not be able to be accommodated. So that was the whole mindset that we as cabinet took around the table. Uh, again, fully uh, guided by Dr. Williams and the healthcare t command table saying, if these numbers keep increasing, this is what we could run into. So we took, uh, I would suggest uh, very specific action and, and uh, uh, as quickly as we can, again, watching because this is all in a lagging manner things that happened over the Christmas season you don't see for two or three weeks truly in, in data until later. So to your point, David, we're seeing the numbers go down. That hopefully is an indication of, of the action we took a couple of weeks ago. Hopefully it will continue. I applaud all of the people, particularly in our own backyard here in Bruce Island Sound, for, for obeying and, and, and being willing to sacrifice their own perhaps needs uh, for the betterment of others. And hopefully everyone across the province will do that and we can get this thing back in a box, get it controlled and move forward. You know, I think I, I think that we're also seeing a, a huge amount of um, innovation, if I can use that word, among people. Um, I noticed that my neighbor has uh, 
decided since Christmas to make a home skating rink in his backyard. And it's his way and he, him and his wife get out there and they can get some exercise. Um, I've noticed, I, and I just heard this morning that uh, people have uh, taken uh, basically uh, open lots and flooded them and created mini skating rinks. And as long as social distancing and numbers are, are kept to a minimum, it, it's a healthy way for people to get out and get some exercise. I'm seeing a lot more people walking. I'm seeing, um, in fact, in, in our house, we have this, I won't say it's a it's a contest, but it's a, um, okay, who's going to walk the dog now? And the dog is well exercised. <laughs> but I think that the, the people are taking some initiative to make sure that they're following the as much as possible the uh, the um, stay at home order and doing what doing what is necessary. I worry if there's anyone I worry about it is people in the larger centers who can't stay at home, who maybe live in large families, or who have to take transit to work, and uh, sometimes they're you know they they just don't have a lot of options, and those are the people that I really worry about. Um, up here in Gray Bruce, we have a lot more open space, but in some of the some parts of the of the uh, GTA, you don't have much. I agree, David. You've raised a number of different things. One being the innovation and people, again, getting out, being creative, doing things. One of the things I've certainly heard anecdotally from a lot of people is it has, it may be forced, it's too powerful of a word, but, but people have actually retrenched a little bit to say, what's really important to me? My family spending time, families gathering, doing board games, uh, people reading more than they were, people exercising, which is always, in my mind, I'm a recreation guy from way back, so it's always good to see people doing those type of things. I, I try to model that and use my social media to show people that not just for the physical, but also the mental side. So that nice long walk, you don't have to run per se, but getting out, having time by yourself, clearing your head, some fresh air, is a good thing. I share your thought process in regard to some of the people and particularly the more urban centers. And again, part of the reasoning from the medical officer of health and the command table, the people that don't physically have to travel and go out, then let's, let's shut that down. So we decrease the, the potential for more uh, exposure and people moving that, that disease across all of our areas. So, you know, there's been a lot of challenge from small business, of course, saying, how come I can't, I can control it. You can to a degree, but there's still that many more people moving. Public transit, the less people on there, the less chance of it being spread throughout our region. So uh, a lot of good things happening from that perspective. Most people have been able to adapt that are able. Um, you know, we're obviously still challenged in areas like ours with broadband. I hope my signal's coming through good today because I have had situations where I, where I kind of lag. Um, but I think lots of opportunity there for people and, uh, you know, I, I think what I'm really seeing is that innovative spirit. And for the most part, particularly in Bruce Grayland Sound, I, I, I'll say it a hundred times in here today. Thank you so much to those people who are obeying, who are adhering, who know that there are some challenges for them, but they're doing it for the greater good. The sooner we can get these numbers down and keep them down, the sooner we can get back to whatever that semblance of normal is going to be in the future. Now, Bill, I just wanted to clarify, maybe you can help me understand this. There are actually two orders in place. There is the stay-at-home order, which is one bit of legislation, um, but there's also the state of emergency order. They're two separate pieces, are they not? Yes, they are, David. If I can kind of try to simplify how I, how I would view it to people is the stay-at-home is really a guideline to say do it. It's for the betterment. It's, it's the necessity uh, for the greater good. And really is a guidance tool, if you will. I, I mean, we didn't go to a curfew. The premier and cabinet were very specific that we weren't going to go to a curfew um, for, for a variety of reasons and felt that that wasn't going to get the result that we wanted. But we needed to be strong enough in our wording to let people know that this was significant, that it was urgent, that it was very important that people adhere to it. The state of emergency order is a much more, uh, I'll say, legislative type of a tool where it gives you certain abilities to do things like enforcement, to, to actually have the ability to move staffing members around, for example, in our home long-term care, where again, a big, big concern, you can move people from a hospital setting into there and have the ability legislatively to do that. And, and that was the key difference. And I, again, neither one of those decisions were taken lightly. There was a lot of deliberation, a lot of discussion, a lot of questioning, 
And again, there isn't a perfect scenario. I, I hear from a lot of people, why can't you be more definitive? Why can't you tell me it will be two weeks or it will be three weeks or it'll be two months? Um, again, this is a fluid situation. The more I talk to Dr. Air and understanding, uh, you have to do modeling to understand what could and may happen and some options, but none of that is, a, is, is an absolute black and white science. So you have to do it, um, but you have to also understand you can't control it. And, and the last thing we can do is predict. If we try to do that and we're wrong, we'll be accused of not being competent. Uh, but we want to be open and transparent and at least give people uh, an idea of where we're trying to head. And it is a slippery slope because I get that people don't understand or, or can't understand sometimes why we can't be more definitive. Believe me, there's nobody at that cabinet table from the premier on down that wishes we could say on this date, this will happen and we'll be ahead of this thing. I noticed that uh, in, in the discussion at the in, at the cabinet table, there was a, a comment in the media that the the I know you're you've got to be very careful about cabinet secrecy or um, and and confidentiality, but the 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 cabinet meeting before the stay at home order was uh, supposed to have uh, happened or taken something like five hours. That sounds like you really did have a robust discussion of the issues involved. That that there was very very uh, a real uh, thrashing out of the issues, so to speak. Absolutely, David. And in those meetings, again, you have the the experts coming in with their modeling and showing you. That then leads to other questions. Uh, you know, to your point, the urban downtown Toronto, if I can, versus a Bruce Gray Owen Sound versus. Uh, the extreme far north, Kenora. I mean, those are three different worlds, uh, all trying to abide by relatively the same rules. You, you have the discussion, should we do this regionally? Can we do it in a different way? What's the communication method if we start allowing differences? Because then people who are human uh, typically want to compare and say, oh, well, my neighbor across you know, the county got to do this. I'm going to go over there and do it. Do you limit that? Don't you limit that? I'll just dive into one a little bit to give you an example, David, because there has been a fair bit of talk, and it's not directly related 100% to my riding, but ski hills, for example. You know, uh, a lot of people thinking they should have opened and they should have been able to open because, again, it's a form of recreation and it's a good thing and people are outdoors. But the, the challenge, again, is you're moving a lot of people from potential hot spots into an area that isn't a hot spot. You have huge gathering. You have people moving back and forth. And what happens during that movement if they stop, if they have a car breakdown, uh, they're again possibly transmitting that into a, yet another area. Uh, you know, obviously that industry came to us and said, we can do this as safe as anybody. There's never been science that says we can't. You're agreed. But at the other hand, you're, you're, exp you're, you're exposing people to that risk if you allow it. And how do you let one industry go and not another? And, and I mean, that goes on and on. You go back to things you know, I've had lots of people locally, uh, particularly business people in hairstyling, for example. You know, I've had X number of people through my salon, not a single case. Okay, well, that's great. But at the end of the day, if you're open, this business can be open and that business can be open. Some things in your, in your, uh, your wife's background, you know, why can a massage therapist be open and this version can't be open? Uh, again, a lot of that gets back into the mindset of the, the medical officers of health, of that ability to transmit is it a necessity, if you will, from a healthcare need as opposed to something that you might be able to make an argument that it's a healthcare need? However, is it truly something that we have to? The overall premise was to say everybody who doesn't have to move, stay at home and we'll get this thing back in a box and then we'll be able to open things up quicker, sooner and hopefully for the long term. That makes sense, Bill. That makes sense. I, I know the skiing issue has been one that has been, uh, I've had friends and colleagues who have said, gee, I wish I could go skiing. And I am saying, look, you live in Toronto. I really don't want you to travel up here and, and go skiing and then go back to Toronto because I, quite frankly, I don't know what you're going to leave here. So, sure. so it makes, it does make a, a lot of sense to, to make sure that, that people are doing their very best to, uh, to stay at home. Uh, let's uh, move on to something that's been perhaps a little more topical or a little more, um, um, yeah, con current. Um, the premier yesterday made a quite a, um, uh, and over the last few days has made qu 
quite a statement about um, restricting passenger air traffic, uh, air passenger traffic, um, because he's, you know, he said, that, you know, this is one of the issues that uh, that is serious. Why, why don't we close the borders? Why don't we stop the um, aircraft from from flying? And the federal government is saying, well, just a minute, it's a little more complex than that. And uh, so, what's behind all of that? First of all. Well, I think again, you know, and to the premier as well, it, it is complex, and we all appreciate that, David. But on the other hand, other countries have done it, other jurisdictions have done it, and and the whole mindset again there is, if you're allowing people to come in and not have all the proper protocols in place, then then that's a risk that we don't need to incur. We've been from day one trying to push the federal government, who are responsible for our borders and our air traffic uh, and those facilities, to be more stringent, to actually put more things in place. Uh, we appreciate there are people that have to move back and forth. We have inter, uh, inter-border trade that, that people, experts have to come in, medical people. Uh, there are people who are Canadian who have every right to return from another country to here. But we, what we can't understand is why they won't go to the absolute most stringent to protect and ensure that there is no ability for someone who has an infection, particularly with the new strains arising around the world, that again, once they come in and start to move, it's very tough to put it back in a box. So, you know, I think what the Premier was trying to do was to suggest, again, we've worked in great collaboration for the most part, the two levels of government, and tried to do that at all times. But there are areas that people are coming to us saying, get those locked down. Why are you, some people are saying, shut them down totally. Don't let anybody in or out of the country or the province. Uh, again, not quite as easy to do is what my, some people might suggest. So we are trying to be reasonable, but we do want to see as much protocol, as much safety put in place that we can control that and limit uh, to complement, frankly, the things we're doing internally in the province so that we get that spread to, to stop, slow down, and at some point get it behind us so the vaccines and our proactive actions can help us get out of this. Well, that's good to hear, Bill, because I think there's been, it's been a, um somewhat challenging uh, message to try and, and figure out between the two because um you know i'd say that's the but that seems to be the way it always is and you kind of listen and figure it out and uh, we, we'll, we'll get to, we'll get there at some point um certainly i know a lot of people are are seeing um are are not traveling we're coming in, you know in the middle of winter a lot of people will travel to florida or some warmer climate for a, a for a, even a week uh some will go to las vegas none of that is happening uh the travel industry is i would think is pretty much decimated uh, that uh i don't know i haven't talked to any travel agents but uh Let's just hope we can put it all back together and uh, next winter, maybe there will be some of this travel and there will be travel allowed, particularly into the United States where uh, Mr. Biden seems to be uh, taking the bull by the horns and, and uh, moving in, in, a, in a more solid direction. For sure, David. I think both that opportunity and, and, and I, I, I do think there is opportunity for that coming forward. Locally, Minister McLeod uh, has also come out with a program and it'll be in effect uh, as we move forward for staycation in Ontario. So again, to try to help, you know, one of the sectors that is truly, and, and you've used the word decimated in many cases, is our tourism and recreation sector. So those businesses we know are going to need some help. We're going to do it. We're going to try to encourage and incentivize people. Uh, and I think it's a great thing. I mean, I'm a proud person of Ontario. I haven't seen all of my province and all the great things that are there to offer. So we're going to come up with a plan. It's in progress of being developed right now to try to encourage people so that if we can't do the international travel still for whatever reason, um, and yes, President Biden, I think, is taking a much different approach, and that's a good thing, but there may still be limitations to go to certain places, uh, both either imposed or you may choose an individual to say, yeah, I'm still not going to some of those hot spots that I, I would have normally. Uh, so I think Ontario has so much to offer. We're so fortunate uh, with all the great things. And I think it's kind of like what you said earlier with people kind of re retrenching a little bit into their own their own lifestyle of reading and fitness and, and eating healthier. I, I think the ability to be able to travel and, and really see the greatness of our province of Ontario is a huge opportunity that we can all buy into, support, and it goes right back to even now support local, do the things that are gonna help the people in your neighborhood, in your community, uh, survive this and thank, uh, you know, hopefully move forward and strive out of this. Well, Bill, we're gonna take a quick break and come back with for more conversation because I wanna talk to you about money. 
Bill. Um, we'll take this quick break and we'll be right back. Friends, I'm David Shearman. This is Politically Speaking. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. My mother said we had to leave home. The communists were going to take my father away. If my parents were afraid, they didn't show us. But we would never forget our escape from Vietnam. We were lost. What was your job in Vietnam? University professor. We had no home. Do you have any family in Canada? No, sir. Nobody wanted us. Welcome to Canada. Canada chose us. Canadians open their borders, their homes, and their hearts to more than 100,000 refugees fleeing persecution after the Vietnam War. We were home. Hi, I'm Sharon Skelly, host of Community Close-Up. Please watch us every week here on Rogers TV. The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hi, and welcome back to Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. My guest is the, the Honorable Bill Walker, MPP for Bruce Gray Owen Sound, and we're talking about all kinds of things uh, from COVID to, well, pretty much everything revolves around COVID these days, doesn't it, Bill? Um, Bill, I wanted to go right back to your own portfolio as Associate Minister of Energy, and we can kiss or kick off this segment by, um, I wanted to just clarify, um, hydro rates. We're, we're, down, down, we're back into that low, low hydro rate 24-7, is that right? Yeah, that's correct, uh, uh, David. What we want to do is, again, that was part of that five-hour deliberation, something right down to something like hydro rates that you have to understand more people are going to be at home. There's going to be more challenge, more cost. So how do we try to support them through that? So what we did is we again went back to the basic rate of 8.5 cents a kilowatt. That allows everybody to be treated the same way. It, it certainly takes that anxiety of should I be using the computer? Should I use the dishwasher? Should I use whatever uh, form of energy that I am? We want to take that away from, from, from people and not add more stress to their system. Uh, we also did a pretty interesting thing a little bit before the, the stay at home which was actually give uh, an adjustment to some of the commercial and, and uh, high-end rates, which again, we had heard for a long time, it was making it very challenging for businesses at the industrial and commercial side to be competitive. And, and they were losing out, a lot of manufacturing had left. So we made an adjustment there. And some people will suggest, well, why would you do that and not give it more to the homeowner? Well, if those businesses aren't there, that has an impact on jobs and that homeowner doesn't have the money from a paycheck to pay even their hydro rates. So again, we, we did it with the mindset that we need that. There's more people I think that you're seeing as a result of COVID and possibly again a positive, repatriating a lot of that, that uh, necessities back to Ontario and being manufactured in Ontario. And we wanna encourage that to ensure that we never get into a situation where we're at, at someone else's luxury of buying things that are PPE, uh, per professional, uh, personal protective equipment or things like vaccines. So. David, trying to do as much as we can across all sectors. Energy certainly plays a key role, and I'm proud with myself and Minister Rickford to have been able to lead that, lead that and ensure that we have rates that people at least take a little bit off of the stress and anxiety they're suffering. Well, when will the, um, the end date of that 8.5 cents uh, a kilowatt hour uh, kick in? When will we see back to the, the, the pre-stay-at-home um, rate? When will that kick in? Good point, David. So the original was a 28-day period, again, trying to acknowledge that we're going to do the stay-at-home, what's that time frame? Uh, and we'll continue like anything 
uh, until we see the data of whether that actually worked. If we have to stay in a lockdown, uh, certainly the intent will be for us as cabinet to review that and go back to treasury board and say, again, do we need to extend it for a period of time? Uh, once we get beyond where again, people are back going to work, doing those things and, and we have to, because all of that money, uh, as you and I shared offline, most of it is borrowed money. So every time it's great to get it, but there is a payback. So, so we'll try to do that in a very balanced, uh, uh, pragmatic manner and, and certainly with fiscal responsibility as, as a key tenant. Well, that raises a, a question for, in my mind at least, Bill. Um, we've we've talked about the cost of COVID, and uh, you've alluded to the fact that there is debt involved for. Um, but is this federal money or provincial money? I mean, uh, debt is debt, obviously. But um, is the is the provinces uh, is this part of the provinces load, or is this something that uh, is being borne by the federal government? So really it's both, David, and there is a mixture in, in any one of the portfolios, any of the uh, ministries, if you will. So in many cases, the difference, and I'll try to keep it short and simplified, but you know, we have our own budget. We have the ability to borrow beyond what a, a normal year would be, and we've obviously had to do that. We, we set a budget actually trying to, to get some of our debt cut until COVID came along. So uh, again, around our table, we felt it was necessary to be able to uh, move further into a debt situation than we would have liked. Uh, we'll have to pay that back as you as a homeowner and anyone listening has to do. Uh, and then there, of course, are federal programs where they will provide funding to the provinces. And then we, in turn, uh, distribute that back out to the municipalities or to the various sectors. So there is a mixture in there. Uh, there are rumors going around again that, you know, there's money sitting in a bank that we've been given by the feds. Why aren't you spending it? And I would just say to you again, we're trying to be very prudent. You don't spend everything today. Uh, not knowing what tomorrow or next week or three weeks down the road may need because who knows where this pandemic will go. So we have kept uh, some contingency so that we can respond to that effectively. The other single difference that we have, David, is we do have a spending limit that we cannot go beyond. The bond agencies will come in and say, you, you're at your limit. It happened back many years ago in, in the Ray government that you actually couldn't borrow any more money. The difference federally is they can continue to print money. They can continue to do that unrestricted, frankly, more so than we can. Uh, and that, that is, again, a challenge for some people saying they're really going out there. They're, they're going to put us to a point where we'll never dig out of this hole. I hear that. Uh, I also hear people saying, I'm so grateful that both levels of government and municipal, frankly, are stepping up and doing the things to get us through this today. Because what happens in 30 years may not have an impact on me if I'm not here. So it is, again, like anything, a balancing act. That's very true, Bill. That's very, very true. And I think the other the other thing is that the um, the federal government, as the prime minister has said, that the, the interest rates are rates are at record lows. And while you're you're correct that the bond agencies will come in and say, eh, eh, "We're not gonna we're not gonna put market your bonds anymore, or we're not gonna help you sell your bonds anymore." That's a conversation, an ongoing conversation. I'm sure that the government has with the with with Bay Street and with the, with the capital markets. That uh, you know, it's it's a it's an how you used the word fluid situation before. I'm quite sure that this is a a fluid and dynamic situation that uh, um, in in the on the fun in the financial world as well. Absolutely, David. And one of the things we can't lose sight of, and you you have referenced it, that the prime prime minister has said you know, we're historically the lowest interest rates we've ever had. And that's a great thing, frankly, right now, both as, again, as a government or you as an individual. Um, but but as typical, those interest rates at some point will come up. And, and you'll recall me probably from the very first program you and I shared on Politically Speaking, one of my biggest concerns was we were spending at that time $12 billion on interest payments to, to, to uh, service the debt we had then. Uh, if we've added and we have added more debt, that means more money going to interest payments. And what happens when they start to go up and that money starts to mean $24 billion going to an interest payment as opposed to long-term care, health, uh, environment, whatever your, your personal causes are. So, again, a very much fluid situation. And we have to not always think we're going to have the interest rates that we have today. And we have to be responsible enough to put a plan in place to say, how do we come back without putting ourselves in jeopardy uh, down the road? Well, I, I am old enough, you're probably not, to remember the days of 18% interest rates, which was great for people who were investing. 
but it really really hurt to you had a mortgage believe me <laughs> so yeah so. david I, I i i recall a conversation with my brother-in-law most of my siblings uh, are kind of quite a bit older than me and i remember him telling me when i was maybe getting to the age of borrowing money and it was just unfathomable to think of 18 percent interest rates i mean you know six eight ten were probably more the standard and and it was unfathomable uh to, to understand that people and now we're kind of at you know one and two percent and and even lower in some cases. So uh, what we can't do is mortgage today on the backs of our kids and our grandkids forever down the road. And that's certainly something that I've always stood by, whether I was in opposition or government. Uh, COVID has challenged us to the point that you have to make decisions to help people through in a current. But again, and, and I do hear this both federally and provincially, people are appreciative, but there also has to be limits. We can't just continue to write empty ended checks uh, and there are a lot of people that, that want that. And, and you also, I think, David, have to be cautious. We've seen it with the seat, or sorry, the CERB. You know, people get accustomed to getting a certain paycheck. Uh, businesses are coming back saying now they're having a hard time getting some of their workers to come back because they want to stay on that program and, and be at home. So, again, very simplistic. And I just use it as an example that we have to be very cautious of what the long term uh, ability to service that borrowing is. Well, I, I, don't, I think you, you make a good point, Bill. Um, I'd like to shift a little bit to, to uh, some of the funding the government has already or has, has announced, uh, your office has announced in the last uh, uh, month or so, um, the Safe Start funding for municipalities to help them get through the, uh, the, the COVID pandemic, mostly for PPE and all the, the good things that, go, that they, they have to do to keep their, um, their staff safe. It was kind of, kind of the kickoff, but then there was an, an announcement for the gas tax, which uh, helps transportation over a million dollars there. Um, and it's uh, you know it's it's quite remarkable. I think as as I was saying in the break, uh, I think I added it up when we're close to twelve million dollars in this writing. That uh, and all of this is necessary. Don't get me wrong. I think it's essential. Um, I think that uh, it's it's really interesting to see that the government is is in is stepping up to help the municipal municipalities and help the communities and to help the uh, various industries. It's 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 refreshing to see. It is, David. And again, kind of unprecedented to the degree of how much. And and it's always a case that I've always believed, you know, the municipalities are an extension of the province, much more granular to the people. And at the end of the day, I think we all have to always remember, maybe this has served again as a positive that might come out of COVID. There's only one taxpayer. So whether it's a municipality, a provincial or or federal, that David Sherman at the end of the day is paying that tax roll uh, somehow. So I, I think it is good. I think we have to make the, the decisions we've we've had to, but we again always have to balance that with the the immediate need versus what's the long term ability to manage and pay that back. And and I think we've tried to strike a balance to help today to to relieve. It's a stressful time to begin with, a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, again, businesses very much have have raised concerns in regard to this last stay at home and and shutting them down. We've tried to be very um, flexible to the businesses to make it very easy for them to apply. They can get up to $20,000 uh, as well as there's a, a fund for personal protective equipment. There is a reduced energy rate. There is a reduced property. So we've tried to do things to help them weather the storm and get through this and understand it isn't about wanting to ever shut a business out or lock them down or not allow them. We did it because if we didn't take that and going right back to an earlier comment, if the numbers got to a point and overwhelmed, we're going to be in a lot longer hurt, a lot more stressful situation, uh, which is going to have more impact negatively on people. So again, we've tried to be responsive. We've tried to think of those things and help them through with the mindset of let's do it for the greater good. And, and if everybody pulls together, we will get through this. One of the things that I, I had not realized, and because perhaps because it, it just didn't make the, um, you know, the, the, the general publicity is that there is uh, a significant amount of support for beef and pork farmers. Um, Five million dollars in the COVID-19 agri, agri recovery beef emergency feed uh, maintenance initiative, and then there's an equivalent amount for pork farmers. I mean, that's that's the kind of thing that is uh, is helpful for uh, for a key for two key industries here in Grey Bruce. Absolutely. Agriculture, again, to me, has always been, always will be a fundamental piece of particularly Bruce Gray Island Sound. If we don't have a healthy food supply chain and food source, we're all going to be in trouble. So, again, 
stepping up where we've tried to. I, I mean, some will say again, not enough. It hasn't been enough over the years, but we're trying to manage and again, be responsible stewards of your money, the taxpayer's money to help industries like agriculture through these lean times, challenging times and get through it. And David, I just wanna, if I can, you know, thank you for raising the, the idea of what, whatever the dollar value exact, you I think referenced 12 million, you know, it's always a challenge. Some people are going to say, Walker, you're, you're spending too much money. You shouldn't be doing that. You've got other people saying, like you, Walker, I'm actually pleased to see that you're willing to step up as a government. Uh, my job, David, in a time like this is to ensure that Bruce Gray Owen Sound gets their fair share. If there's going to be funds given out, I will work my tail off to make sure we get our fair, equitable share back into Bruce Gray Owen Sound. And, and to your point, I, I think, uh, you know, I'm pleased with the amount of money that we've been able to bring to the riding and on a whole host of things from healthcare to infrastructure uh, that, that are going to help us not only today, but again, put some of those infrastructure pieces in place that will be a benefit for many, many years to come. And I'm very proud of some of those type of things. We were down at the Owen Sound Bridge, uh, 10th Street Bridge a little while ago. That will be there for the next 100 years. So great to get money for it today. That'll serve our community well for many, many years as just an example. Bill, I wanted to ask you, um, you've, you've had the long-term care file for, for many years, uh, going back to the time you were in opposition, so you're very well versed in the whole issue of long-term care. And I know the government is uh, putting a lot of money into long-term care, but I can't help but think one of the spin-offs from COVID is going to be um, some foundational shifts in how we do long-term care, simply from things like design of, of, uh, of buildings. Um, what's your take on this? Will we be seeing big changes in long-term care, um, policy, philosophy, design, um, or are we just right now just trying to make sure, keep people healthy? So a bit of both, David. So I, I will share forgetting COVID for a couple of seconds, and that's pretty hard to do. We, we focus most of our lives on it. Um, we were already taking a look at some of those things, and, and I think Minister Fullerton's doing a great job. Again, someone very specific to long-term care who's focused on that. But you can't take something that for many, many years, in my mind, and I don't mean as a, as a political statement, but it was neglected. There weren't a lot of things happening uh, in long-term care. Uh, just as, a, as an example, over 15 years, there were only 600 beds built. Well, you knew the demographic was moving. You knew you were going to need more. We, we initiated that and made a pledge to do that. I think you see things like the design, as you suggested. So in our own backyard, Rockford Terrace down in Durham is, has, has four bed wards. That is what's called a, a, a C or a B class facility. All of them are being moved over time to A classification, which means there won't be any of those. And that was one of the biggest things, David, that happened particularly early in COVID with some of the challenges and the deaths that we experienced as people were congregated in a four ward, four bed ward uh, if that hadn't have happened, we could have managed that in a much better way because you would have had natural isolation. So those type of things definitely will. We already, again, in the midst of, of even COVID, have agreed to move to a, a minimum of four hours of care. So that's a good step forward. Some, again, will say not enough, not quick enough, um, but it is there. And the other piece, I think, is the whole human uh, health, human resource, and, and ensuring that we have proper staff, uh, enough, enough staff, frankly, and that one of the things there, uh, you know, and again, from my experience, PSWs, the, the personal support workers, about 50% of the people that go through the program aren't there within a year. And 50% of those even leave the actual profession. So obviously that isn't going to be changed overnight. It needs a lot of thought. And again, I think you're, you're seeing someone, um, Dr. Fullerton, Minister Fullerton has practical experience in the healthcare side, and I think is doing a fabulous job of trying to look at all the opportunities. And to your point earlier, innovation, different policy thought processes are going to come out of it. Uh, it just isn't gonna happen in the middle of a pandemic always. And it's gonna take some time, even with the physical building. Uh, I can't say enough though in our backyard, Gray Gables, Rockwood, South Bridge, Inland Sound. I mean, we're having great success. Uh, Hanover's getting some new beds. So again, Proportionately speaking, I believe we're doing well in what we're moving forward with with our long-term care facilities in Bruce Gray Island Sound. Well, it'll be interesting to see the change in design and, and, and change in community. I'm familiar uh, with all of the places, of course, not Southbridge because it's not built yet. Um, I'm very familiar with 
all of the long-term care homes in, in Gray Bruce. And uh, it, they, they are all, because they're all of different ages, they're all of different designs. And uh, it'll be good to see that, it, or to look, to, to look at the lessons learned from this pandemic and to see how, uh, what impact it has on, on long-term care. Because I suspect by the time uh, we get it right, that'll be where you and I will be. <laughs> no, you're not you, but me. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, Dave. I, I'll, I'll share one anecdotal. I, I did a fair tour of the province when I was still the critic. And one of the things that was really interesting, and, and it was a pretty easy observation, and I think you'll understand it very quickly, those older facilities were designed with great big, huge, massive halls and cafeteria areas. If you go back 20 or 30 years, what I'm told is three out of five people going to long-term care actually drove up to the front door, carried their own suitcase in, and, and went in. Now you've got most, you know, 80% of the people need some kind of a mobility device. So you don't need these massive halls where people aren't going to be sitting in congregating. And, and even down to an equipment side, uh, a lot of the things like chairs and tables, you're not going to have stationary chairs. Most of them are in rollers so that people again can be moved, which is better for the staff. They can move them, they can roll them. So I think, I think it's going to be an industry with lots of opportunity and lots of opportunity for innovation and, and people getting creative of how we do it, but it comes down to a fundamental design of how do we make sure it's space that's valuable and providing value to the person as opposed to you know, just the size of the space. Well, let's have this conversation in 20 years, Bill. <laughs> Happy to, <laughs> and let's hope we're not in one. <laughs> Very true. I want to, uh, before we go, because we've got about uh, eight minutes left, I wanted to touch touch on one of the issues you and I have talked about on many occasions before, and that's rural broadband. And uh, I'll, I'll just let people know that um, I've actually heard Bill Walker talk like Donald Duck, because we there were some broadband issues that we had uh, connecting for our show today, and... We actually had to, he had to hang up and reconnect, which is not an unusual situation. But I think it also says we do have, have broadband issues in Grey Bruce. I've had parents um, who have been uh, telling me during the, the, the close, of, during the lockdown and the school closure that um, they're in such a bad place, they, they can't get any kind of signal for their kids to go to school. And in one case, this was a grade 12 student. Mom had to say, here are the keys to the truck. You go over and park in the school parking lot because there you can get access to the school Wi-Fi. And that's what the kid did to get his to, because he needed those hours of attendance and and uh, assignments for, for grade 12. Where are we at? Are we going to be is this going to be improving over time? Absolutely, David. And again, I always try to look for a positive, even in something as bleak as COVID. And I think what this has really done is shone the spotlight on the difference of the world as we now experience it. So many more people at home that can work from home, frankly, people that want to get out of the city to a, a, a beautiful spot like Bruce Barrel and Sound, but they need that connectivity. So, you know, a couple of good things already immediately have happened. So we have recently had SWIFT uh, expand into our area as our phase for Bruce Gray on Sound in southwestern Ontario. $16 million, I believe, in Bruce County, $17 million for Gray County combined. Uh, so that's moving. At the highest level, we pledge up to a billion dollars from the provincial government to expand broadband across the province. And I can assure you that from Peter Bethenfall, who is the finance minister, to Laurie Scott as the infrastructure minister, we're pushing the federal government to say again, you're doing great things, but there's even more that needs to be done. And I think, you know, to the point, I'll go out on a limb and say, this to me is like years and years and years ago when we actually put the railroads across the country. This is absolutely critical, whether it's healthcare, whether it's home care, whether it's your educational aspect, this is huge opportunity. The question becomes, David, it's, it's a monumental task. If you think of just the geography of Bruce Gray Owen Sound, we have a lot of rock around, which makes it more expensive and more challenging and time consuming. But just to cover all those little back roads and everybody to be able to get it. So I'm hopeful again, innovation, creativity, and absolutely there's a commitment from the provincial government to keep expanding it wherever we can. Well, it'll be interesting to see how it rolls out. Um, it, this stuff doesn't fall off trees. It's uh, something that uh, takes time, and because uh, it's highly technical, it takes a, a certain amount of expertise to install. And uh, we'll just, you know, I, I, I would expect within uh, a couple of years, you and I will be having a very different conversation because of the uh, of, of improvements. At least I hope that will be the case, Bill. I agree. Uh, 
it's it's certainly something that will be a a, a, a big change. You you mentioned the railroads. I would perhaps draw um, another parallel that's related to Ontario, and that is the establishment of um, Ontario Hydro and rural electrification, uh, which happened right after the Second World War. And I know uh, there was a whole generation of electrical workers that that were uh, got their start during the rural electrification process uh, or system, and uh, it was very very. Um, uh, had a huge impact here in Grey Bruce because all of a sudden uh, a farmer could use an electric milking machine and they could have electric lights and they could have uh, um, an electric water pump or even flush toilets. So it, it had a huge impact on the lifestyle of Grey Bruce. Some would say it wasn't a good impact, but that's it for another day. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point, the point is. You know, that's the biggest parallel I can I can draw. That rural electrification push that ran hydro, ran uh, power poles up and down every single concession across Ontario, and uh, you know we're we're replacing it now. But it brought a huge, huge change for the better. I think. Absolutely, David. I, I think this is a game changer for Bruce Gray on Sound, if you will. Uh, the ability to, again, whether you're in Tobermory, Feversham, Clavering, Shell Lake, you know, you name any little hamlet, this gives sustainability back to some of those smaller little areas that actually people can, again, come back to the family farm if that's what they, they moved to the city. Now they can come back. Uh, you know, I, I think just indicative of our real estate market right now, you know, you try to find a piece of property or a home to buy currently because there's so many people clamoring to get out of the cities and this is what's going to allow it to happen i think and, and equitably sustain our communities out in rural ontario i'm a big fan i can assure you i'm pushing at every opportunity to get our fair share and to make sure we can do it as effectively and again there's different technologies it doesn't have to just be one and i think there's going to be a lot more development on different ways to to capture because there are challenges again you know if i think of the bruce peninsula and trying to drill uh, through the escarpment in every single place to get to every little nook and cranny, that's not going to be financially viable. But there's other different types of technology that we can com compete and uh, collaborate at the same time to ensure we can. And I think it's a huge, and, and it's a great analogy back to energy. And, and interestingly, even in my portfolio, something as simplistic as working with the Hydro One poles and how do we get those lines spread there as quickly and as low cost effectively as we possibly can. And that's something I'm physically working on as we speak. That's great to hear, Bill. That's great to hear. Um, just out of, out of curiosity, I, we've just got a, a couple of minutes left. Let's talk, let's, can I ask you about the Markdale Hospital? Absolutely. <laughs> where, where is that at? So, David, it, it has gone to tender. Uh, tenders have been in. The hospital corporation, Grey Bruce Health Services, has in fact made their recommendation who, who they would like to work with. That now goes through a process within the ministry just to kind of, again, do the final checks and balances, and then they will award that. And ironically, I was just speaking yesterday with Gary, the CEO from Grey Bruce Health Services, and, and we'll be putting another call into the health ministry to say, where are we at? What's the status? When are we doing the actual announcement? Because I want to make sure that we actually, the premier has toured that facility. He has a personal interest. And I want to make sure we can do an announcement as soon as we can to keep people moving and spread that great news that we are just at that finish line. And COVID again is making it a little more daunting how we would normally do a ribbon cutting and, and do it that way. Uh, frankly, I don't care about any of that. I just want the words to go out publicly. It's here and shovels are going in the ground. Uh, so as quickly as I possibly can, we'll make that happen. You know, I suspect if you were given the opportunity, Bill, you'd be driving the, st you'd be uh, right behind the, the controls of the steam shovel that would open up that, uh, the first hole. 100% David, this is one of the biggest things from the day I got elected that people were to me, yeah. I committed to getting it done. And I, again, I, I will until we get there, we'll, we'll stick with it every day. But I'm very, very, very confident that we're, we're just right next to it. It's just a matter of a short period of time while we go through the formalities and put that together. Well, Bill, on that really positive, upbeat note, I want to say thank you for being a part of Politically Speaking today. It's always a pleasure to have you with us and to uh, uh, hear about what's happening and to uh, ask the questions, 
because I know if this is uh, the things about COVID are on everyone's mind. Thank you for all your hard work for, for the people of this writing, and I'm sure we'll be talking again. Thank you very much, David. Everybody be safe, stay at home, stay safe, save lives. Thank you, friends. I'm David Shearman. My guest has been Bill Walker, MPP for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. We'll see you again. Thank you.